Moscow will forever be known as the scene of one of the most tragic crimes in American history. There's still sort of a, a darkness whenever you talk to people. It will be ever part of the university's history and the town's history. There are four very, very important names in this case. Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, Zana Cronodal, and Ethan Chapin. And if you're gonna remember any names from this case, I ask that it be all four. My name is Olivia Gonzalez, and Kaylee was my little sister. Oh, everybody's going to work, and you look out the window, and there's kids running down the street laughing, and you're just like, how can you be out there playing? My daughter's dead. You know, Keely Gonzalez is gone. Stop everything. Everybody in the whole world, stop. And everything just keeps going. My sister, Zanna Kernodal, is one of the happiest, funniest people I've ever met. And I had the awesome privilege of growing up with her, and I still have a hard time coming to terms with the facts that it did happen. Brian Koberg is accused of stabbing these four University of Idaho students in the pre-dawn hours on November 13th, 2022. Uh, the murder weapon, which was a knife, has never been found. This is a type of survival knife. Brian Koberger did not make his own plea. The judge entered a plea for him of not guilty. Maximum penalties, life in prison, or the death penalty. Due to the nature of the crimes, the state of Idaho is seeking the death penalty. He was there to kill. He came in with a kit. I believe he had a kill kit. And you believe that everything right down to the implement of destruction, this large marine knife, that was all planned? All planned. It was inhumane. You wouldn't do these type of things to any living creature, let alone an innocent human being. The star piece of evidence in the prosecution's case is the DNA that was found on the knife sheath that was left at the crime scene. But there's so much other evidence that's also pointing towards nobody else that we're aware of. How was Brian Koberger's car spotted leaving the scene? Why was his cell phone seen there 12 times, including the morning after the offense? The prosecution would like everyone to believe that it's an open and shut case. But I think the facts they have make the case more open than open and shut. According to the defense, there is no connection whatsoever between Brian Koberger and the victims. And if there is no connection, then there is no motive. And if there is no motive, then it becomes very hard to make the case that he is the killer. And this is a graduate student, not a trained assassin. It's more so about putting these pieces together because I know what the puzzle looks like at the end. I have the box in front of me, but I'm missing so many pieces. How did all of these pieces fall to create what I'm living in right now? Where did, where did this come from? Nestled in the heart of Idaho, Moscow embodies an idyllic blend of vibrant student life and a close-knit community. Renowned for its student-centric atmosphere, the city thrives around the prestigious University of Idaho, fostering an environment where academia meets a spirited collegiate lifestyle. The neighborhood surrounding the university bustled with students residing in hostels, rented university properties, and homes just beyond the campus bounds. Despite Moscow's academic fame, occasional covert gatherings took place, where students convened with friends and loved ones. Yet, these gatherings were typically uneventful. However, on the chilling November 13, 2022 night, four university students experienced a harrowing turn of events while unwinding after a party, disrupting the peaceful atmosphere they had anticipated. And this happened in this three-story house. The story begins with four individuals enrolled at the University of Idaho. 20-year-old Ethan Chapin, hailing from Conway, Washington. 21-year-old Kaylee Gonzalez, from Rathdrum, Idaho. 20-year-old Zana Kernodal, belonging to Post Falls, Idaho. And 21-year-old Madison Mogan, originating from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Ethan was a freshman while Zana was a junior. 
Meanwhile, both Cayley and Madison were seniors at the university. Ethan James Chapin, the eldest of triplets, was born at 4.43 p.m. on a picturesque Tuesday evening of October 29, 2002, at Swedish Hospital in Seattle. Maisie arrived moments later at 4.44, followed by Hunter at 4.45. Initially residing in Olympia at Summit Lake, the family spent the initial year and a half there before relocating to Conway. The children attended Conway School, receiving excellent education while actively participating in soccer, basketball, and cross-country. Ethan cherished fond moments of playing basketball alongside his brother at Conway, adorned in their team jerseys. Subsequently, Ethan enrolled at Mount Vernon High School, yet his on-campus schooling or normal schooling was disrupted by the onset of the COVID pandemic. Alongside his siblings, Ethan transitioned to Idaho, working at Hills Resort before attempting to resume studies at MVHS, which remained affected. They later worked at Tulip Town during the tulip season before returning to Hills Resort in Idaho for summer employment, just before commencing their stint at the University of Idaho. In August 2021, Ethan's family embarked on a journey to the University of Idaho to drop off their three children to college. Both Ethan and Hunter joined the fraternity Sigma Chi, while Maisie became part of the Kappa Alpha Theta sorority. Since beginning his studies at the University of Idaho, Ethan embraced a vibrant social life, engaged in intramural sports, and managed his academic responsibilities. He continued his passion for sports and also developed a romantic relationship with Zana Kernodal during this time. Zana Alexia Kernodal was born on July 5, 2002, at Kootenai Health Hospital in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and grew up in Post Falls. Her early years were marked by her talent as a gymnast, showcasing her skills from a young age. Throughout her schooling at Post Falls Middle and High School, Zana actively participated in volleyball, track, and soccer until her graduation in 2020. Alongside her studies, she also worked at Texas Roadhouse. Upon enrolling at the University of Idaho, Zana pursued a major in marketing while immersing herself in extracurricular activities, notably as an engaged member of the Pi Beta Phi sorority and the Vandal Solution sales team. Juggling these commitments, she also held a part-time position at the Mad Greek Restaurant in Moscow, Idaho. Beyond her academic and professional pursuits, Zana found joy in her dog, Shoeshine, cherished moments at EDM concerts, relished spending quality time with friends, and eagerly embarked on family trips with her sister and father. Her childhood was filled with fond memories of her grandparents' farm and summers spent by the river. Zana's vibrant personality made her deeply loved by her family, friends, and classmates. Known for her positive and outgoing nature, she had a special ability to make everyone feel included. Her zest for life, infectious humor, and unwavering enthusiasm made an indelible mark on all who had the privilege of knowing her. Now, Zana's co-occupant during her time at the University of Idaho, Madison May Mogan, was born on May 25, 2001, in Eugene, Oregon. She brought immense joy to her family and all around her from the very beginning. After spending her initial two years in Oregon, Madison's family relocated to the North Idaho region where her parents had their roots. Her upbringing in Idaho was nothing short of wonderful. Beginning her education at Winton Elementary, she later transitioned to Coeur d'Alene Charter Academy before ultimately choosing to enroll in LCHS, a decision she made after articulating her reasons in a decisive letter alongside her lifelong friend, who was practically her sister, Kaylee. It was evident to everyone who knew her that Maddie's endearing personality made her feel immensely loved. Her unique, offbeat, and humorous approach brought smile and laughter to others. And it was a well-known fact that keeping her well-fed was essential. Maddie was respected for her determination and commitment to her future endeavors, excelling in academics and every job she undertook during high school and college. She built a network of friends, colleagues, supervisors, and teachers who admired her work ethic, care, and dedication. Excited about her academic pursuit at the University of Idaho, though a little farther from home, Maddie thrived, consistently earning a spot on the dean's list each semester. Joining Pi Beta Phi, she formed enduring bonds with close friends and also cherished having Kaylee alongside. 
Additionally, she found love with a boy named Jake, who held a special place in her heart. Now Maddie's best friend, Kaylee Jade Gonzalez, was born in Concord, California on June 8, 2001. Even before her arrival, she was a radiant spark for her parents, Steve and Christy Gonzalez. As the third child, Kaylee brought a unique energy with her, born with distinctive black, thick curls, a charming button nose, and a perfectly round porcelain face, adorned with a mysterious tiny scar on her forehead. Teased by her siblings about her horns, she remained a spirited and cherished middle child among her five siblings. Around the age of one, Kaylee and her family relocated to North Idaho, where her vibrant personality flourished. Growing into a beautiful, authentic, and social individual, she adored Claire's, fashion accessories, and had an innate talent for eliciting laughter from those around her. Her educational journey began at Bora Elementary alongside her older brother and sister before transitioning to Charter Academy for Middle School, where she crossed paths with Maddie Mogan, making the start of an inseparable bond. From that day forward, their lives intertwined, transforming their family of five into a family of six. Despite initial hesitations from her parents, Kaylee attended Lake City High School before venturing out to the University of Idaho alongside Maddie. Joining the Alpha Phi sorority, she pursued her aspirations of becoming an elementary school teacher. Throughout her academic years, Kaylee demonstrated remarkable scholastic achievements, complemented by her ability to effortlessly make friends wherever she went. Her social quirky and infectious personality often infused a sense of humor and a hint of mischief into her interactions. Enthusiastic about adventure and pranks, she balanced her studies with a full-time job, showcasing her diligent work ethic. During their tenure at the University of Idaho, Madison and Zana resided together in a rental home located in close proximity to the university campus. Kaylee had previously been a resident of the same house, but had recently moved out. However, on the evening of November 12, 2022, Kaylee returned to the residence to attend a nearby party. Earlier on the evening of November 12, two of the four students, Ethan and Zana, were present at an on-campus gathering organized by the nearby Sigma Chi fraternity, which lasted from 8 to 9 p.m. Subsequently, they arrived back home, which was the rented house, at 1.45 a.m. Meanwhile, the remaining two individuals, close friends Maddie and Kayla, had spent their evening at the Corner Club, a downtown sports bar, arriving at 10 p.m. and departing around 1.30 a.m. By 1.56 a.m., all four individuals had indeed returned to the shared rental house. Moreover, the building accommodated two additional students who resided on the ground floor, sharing the space with them. All of them retired to bed for the night. One of the residents, Dylan Mortensen, stayed on the ground floor. Maddie and Kaylee shared a bed, while the other residents stayed on the same floor, but in a separate room adjacent to theirs. And Zana and Ethan shared Zana's bed. During the early morning hours of November 13, 2022, one of the residents, apart from the aforementioned, who was asleep on Maddie and Kaylee's floor, was awakened by sounds resembling Zana and her dog. She even sensed hearing Zana saying, there's someone here. Meanwhile, Dylan on the ground floor, upon hearing unusual sounds, opened her room door twice to investigate. During the second instance, she discerned what appeared to be cries emanating from Zana's room, accompanied by a male voice reassuring, It's okay, I'm going to help you. Curiosity compelled her to open the door a third time, revealing a figure draped in black attire and a mask covering their mouth and nose, advancing in her direction. The unfamiliar individual, unnoticed by Dylan, proceeded past her and utilized the sliding glass door to depart. Stricken by a state of shock, she stood frozen momentarily, eventually seeking safety by locking herself within her room. No calls to 911 were immediately made. However, at 11.58 a.m. on November 13, 2022, hours following the incident, a call was finally placed from within the residence, utilizing a roommate's cell, requesting aid for an unconscious individual. Upon police arrival, they discovered the home's door open with no signs of forced entry or internal damage. Nothing seemed to be missing from the premises. 
Both the roommates were inside when the authorities arrived. However, the police made a grisly and distressing discovery. The heartbreaking truth unfolded. Zana, Ethan, Maddie, and Kaylee had been fatally stabbed while in their respective beds on the second and third floors of the home. The victims were found without restraints or gags, and blood spatter stained the walls at the scene. Maddie and Kaylee were located in Maddie's bedroom, while Zana and Ethan were discovered in Zana's room. However, the lingering question remained. Why did the killer spare the lives of the two roommates? Homicide detective Phil Waters speculated that the assailant may not have noticed Dylan or the other girl in the darkness. However, this assumption cannot be unequivocally regarded as the absolute truth. At present, it's the closest explanation available, pending further investigation and evidence. The surviving roommates had summoned friends to the home as they were concerned about one of the victims on the second floor, believing her to be unconscious and unresponsive. Though the identity of the 911 caller was withheld, the police verified that the caller was not regarded as a suspect in the tragic incident. Two roommates have been ruled out conclusively. Can you tell us if they were the ones that called 911? So still, we're not going to release that information yet? That particular piece of information seems to be fueling a lot of conspiracies and, and making your jobs harder. That is correct. Uh, there are a lot of conspiracies out there. There's a lot of conjecture. However, you know, we have to work on the facts. During the investigation, the police uncovered a live-streamed video on Twitch by the Grub Truck, a food truck located four blocks south at Friendship Square. The footage depicted Maddie and Kaylee at 1.41 a.m. engaged in conversation and displaying smiles. Ten minutes later, they acquired their food and departed, initially presumed to have taken an Uber ride home, covering the distance of approximately one mile. Seven unsuccessful phone calls were registered from Kaylee's phone to her ex-boyfriend, a fellow student, between 2.26 and 2.52 a.m. Additionally, Maddie attempted to contact Kaylee's former boyfriend three times during a similar time frame, from 2.44 to 2.52 a.m., all resulting in unanswered calls. These calls underwent investigation, with police ultimately concluding that they did not consider the recipient of those missed calls to be involved in the crime. Following a forensic examination of Zana's cell phone, records indicated her activity on the TikTok app at 4.12 a.m. Additionally, security cameras positioned near the residence captured audio recordings of whimpering, a notable loud thud, and repeated barking from a dog, commencing approximately at 4.17 a.m. Detectives deduced that the tragic killings took place within a window of time estimated to be between 4 a.m. and 4.25 a.m. On the evening following the tragic events of November 13, the university made the decision to cancel classes for November 14. Furthermore, they arranged a candlelight vigil, initially planned to be held on the UI Administration Building lawn for the evening of November 16, which was subsequently postponed for two weeks. Initially, investigators stated that there appeared to be no immediate risk to the community following the day of the killings. However, three days later, Moscow Police Chief James Fry revised the assessment, stating, we cannot definitively assert that there's no threat to the community. I'm going to be reading from my notes today because I want the information you received to be extremely accurate. The four were stabbed with a knife, but no weapon has been located at this time. There was no sign of forced entry into the residence. Based on details at the scene, we believe this was an isolated, targeted attack on our victims. Fall break had been planned to commence after November 18, with classes set to resume on November 28. However, in response to the initial assurances provided by the police being met with skepticism and concern from many residents and other Moscow residents regarding their safety, an early Thanksgiving holiday exodus from the area began. Some individuals who chose to remain were understandably anxious and exercised caution, leading several professors to cancel their classes during this period. The fathers of Kaylee Gonzalez and Ethan Chapin expressed criticism concerning the restricted information flow from both the police and the university to the families of the victims. I had uh, private investigators and different different things, and that's why they told me to slow down, Steve. You know this thing. You know, you me as a, as a father, it's never fast enough, and I want to just charge ahead like uh, probably just like a dumbass, but that's what I knew.
Additionally, a wave of speculation and misinformation about the case emerged on social media, propagated by individuals on platforms like TikTok, self-identified psychics, and various other social media users. In response to this escalating situation, the Moscow Police Department rebuked internet sleuths for their involvement in generating widespread online rumors and disrupting the ongoing investigations. In a news release issued on December 2, they highlighted the speculative nature of the information circulating without factual substantiation, which was fueling community anxieties and disseminating falsehoods. Our um, investigation will continue to look at all avenues of that investigation. Um, I cannot disclose um, any of that information. I don't even know that information at this point in time, and that's why we're continuing to investigate. The Latta County Coroner conducted autopsies on the four victims on November 17, 2022, revealing that all had sustained multiple stab wounds, particularly fatal ones inflicted on the chest and upper body. The nature of the wounds indicated that a large knife or very similar ones had been used in the attacks. Additionally, at least one victim displayed defensive wounds on their hands, suggesting attempts to fend off the assailant, with the possibility that others also made similar efforts. Disturbingly, the victims may have been attacked while they were asleep in their beds. However, no evidence suggested any form of assault in the tragic deaths. The coroner unequivocally declared all four deaths as homicides resulting from stabbing, yet none of the victims were found tied or gagged. Despite thorough investigations, no weapon has been recovered. Authorities suspect that the perpetrator or perpetrators employed a thick blade knife in the commission of the crime. The surviving roommate who had cited the suspect provided a description, portraying the individual as an unfamiliar male, approximately 5 foot 10 inches tall, the roommate noted that the suspect was not notably muscular, but possessed an athletically built physique, further emphasizing distinctively bushy eyebrows as a notable feature of the individual's appearance. On November 19, 2022, law enforcement authorities appealed to the public for any video footage captured at the residence on the night of the tragic incident. To facilitate the collection of potential evidence, a phone tip line and email address were established, encouraging students and other individuals to submit any relevant information to the authorities. During a press conference held on November 23, 2022, the Moscow police chief disclosed that authorities had received several tips, one of which suggested that Kaylee might have had a stalker. However, at that point, law enforcement officials were unable to substantiate or confirm the reliability of that claim, nor were they able to identify any individual fitting the description of the potential stalker. By December 5, 2022, the response from the public was substantial, with more than 2,600 tips submitted via email, approximately 2,700 phone calls received, and additional 1,000 digital media submissions through these designated tip lines. Subsequently, on December 24, 2022, the investigative team disclosed that they had amassed a staggering count of at least 15,000 tips pertaining to the case from various sources and members of the public. Initially, the police did not rule out the possibility of there being more than one perpetrator involved in the tragic incident. Authorities expressed their belief that the attack was potentially targeted. However, they had yet to determine definitively whether the target was the residence itself or its occupants. After receiving numerous tips from the public, on December 15, 2022, the police announced their intention to scrutinize records involving approximately 22,000 fifth-generation Hyundai Elantras manufactured between 2011 and 2013. Surveillance footage from the area had captured video evidence of an Elantra present around the time of the tragic incident. Investigators observed that this vehicle had made multiple passes along the same route in close proximity to the residence. Another surveillance recording, acquired by investigators, depicted an Elantra passing by the victim's home three times, commencing around 3.29 a.m. Subsequently, at 4.04 a.m., the Elantra returned to the residence for a fourth time. Notably, at 4.20 a.m., the same car was observed speeding away from the victim's neighborhood. Some days later, the investigators finally tracked the ownership of the Elantra vehicle to a local resident, Brian Koberger who had driven it along with his father to the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania for the holiday season. He and his father were pulled over by the police for tailgating. Hey, 
Hello. How you doing? How y'all doing today? Good, good. Take a look at your driver's license real quick if I could. So he's right up on that van, man. He was right up on the back end of that van. Old Jover for tailgating. Is this your car? Okay. Cool. During their journey, Brian Koberger was pulled over again by the Indiana State Police on Interstate 70 outside Greenfield, Indiana, for infractions of speeding and tailgating. However, the FBI refuted allegations that they had directed the Indiana State Police to conduct these stops. Subsequently, when investigators dug deeper into Koberger's whereabouts, they acquired cell phone data indicating Koberger's phone had ceased connecting to the network around 2.47 a.m. in Pullman on November 13, 2022, before reconnecting at approximately 4.48 a.m. near Blaine, Idaho, an area near U.S. Highway 95 south of Moscow. It's not about evidence. It's about the lack of evidence that actually matters. In this particular case, we had a cell phone that was turned off for a very specific window of time. During a window of time where four people were murdered and he is the singular suspect, that means something. Further cell phone data revealed that Koberger's phone accessed a cell tower in close proximity to the victim's residence at around 9 a.m. on November 13, 2022, roughly five hours after the tragic incident occurred. Moreover, police obtained data indicating that his phone had pinged from the cell phone tower nearest to the residence at least 12 times between June 2022 and November 13, 2022. However, this was not all. In addition to this evidence, investigators collected a DNA sample from the crime scene that did not match the DNA of any of the victims. This DNA was discovered on a tan leather knife sheath found on Maddie's bed. Authorities utilized a public genealogy database, which led them to a partial match with an individual having a familial connection to Koberger. Subsequently, investigators pursued this lead and successfully traced the DNA evidence to Koberger by matching it with DNA retrieved from the trash collected at his family's residence in Pennsylvania. Investigators proceeded to surveil Koberger outside his parents' residence in Pennsylvania. During surveillance, Koberger was observed on multiple occasions wearing surgical gloves and placing trash bags into a neighbor's garbage can. Koberger was found awake uh, in the kitchen area, uh, dressed in shorts and a shirt and wearing um, latex uh, medical type gloves and apparently was taking his personal trash and putting it into separate Ziploc baggies. Subsequently, the items retrieved from the trash were sent to the Idaho State Lab for further testing as part of the investigation. Authorities also noted that Koberger had meticulously cleaned his vehicle, thoroughly addressing both the interior and exterior, ensuring that no area was overlooked or left uncleaned. On December 30, 2022, 28-year-old Brian Christopher Koberger was apprehended unveiling comprehensive details about his background and personal information. The Federal Bureau of Investigation detectives arrested 28-year-old Brian Christopher Kohlberger in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, on a warrant for murder. Brian Christopher Kohlberger was born on November 21, 1994, hailed from Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. Raised in Pennsylvania with his parents, Michael and Marianne, and two sisters, Amanda and Melissa, Kohlberger's online presence was limited until his arrest. His academic pursuits primarily focused on criminality and psychology, aligning with his family's inclination towards education, especially in psychology-related fields. He graduated from Pleasant Valley High School in 2013 and attended Monroe Career and Technical Institute in Bartonsville, but dropped out a year later. Koberger pursued an associate degree in psychology at Northampton Community College in Bethlehem, which he obtained in 2018. After his graduation, he secured a position as a security guard within the Pleasant Valley School District, where his father had previously held a maintenance role for an extended period, and his mother had served as a substitute teacher for a while. While at work, Koberger's proactive response during a colleague's medical emergency garnered local attention in Pennsylvania. However, before this, his high school years were marked by weight-related bullying. Koberger underwent a significant weight loss, transforming his appearance and purportedly impacting his demeanor. 
Friends noted a noticeable shift in his behavior post-weight loss, describing instances of bullying and manipulation within his social circle. Several acquaintances asserted that Koberger battled drug abuse, allegedly starting with marijuana, to cope with teenage harassment and escalating to a heroin addiction. He may have been a little odd or a little off, but like other than that, you'd never expect someone to, to be allegedly part of a quadruple homicide, ever. He reportedly sought rehabilitation after high school, continuing his education with an associate's degree, and later pursuing higher studies at DeSales University in Center City, Pennsylvania, where he excelled academically in psychology and criminology. And finally, in 2022, he received his master's degree in criminal justice. Koberger ventured to Washington State University for a PhD program in Pullman, Washington, aiming to achieve a career in law enforcement. However, during this time, he encountered disciplinary issues in his teaching assistant role due to behavioral problems and problematic attitudes toward women. Email correspondence between Koberger and Professor John Snyder revealed repeated warnings about his professionalism and conduct. Ultimately, on December 19, 2022, a month after the tragic murders, Koberger was terminated from his teaching position at WSU. On December 30, 2022, Brian Koberger was apprehended at his parents' residence in Monroe County, Pennsylvania, by an FBI SWAT team and Pennsylvania State Police. During the arrest, officials discovered Koberger in the kitchen, attired in a shirt and shorts, donning examination gloves, and sorting trash into individual Ziploc baggies. He faced charges of four counts of first-degree murder and one felony count of burglary upon his arrest. Assigned a public defender, he remained incarcerated without bond at the Monroe County Correctional Facility in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. Koberger's legal representatives asserted his innocence and his determination to establish his clean hands. His family issued a statement extending sympathies to the victims and emphasized the importance of presuming their son's purity. Individuals within Koberger's social circle were stunned by the accusations against him although some from his past were less surprised by the allegations. Koberger then consented to extradition during his initial appearance at the county courthouse on January 3, 2023. Subsequently, on January 4, he was transported by flight to Pullman and then driven to the latter county jail in Moscow, where he was detained without bail. A week later, on January 12, 2023, he appeared for a status conference in the same courtroom at the courthouse. On May 17, 2023, the Latta County District Court disclosed that Koberger had been formally charged by a grand jury with five offenses, four counts of first-degree murder, and one count of felony burglary. The scheduled preliminary hearing set for June 26 was annulled following the indictment. On Monday, May 22, 2023, in Latta County District Court, Koberger declined to enter a plea. As just seen, the judge, in response to this unconventional stance, proceeded to enter a not guilty plea on behalf of Koberger, paving the way for a trial where he could potentially face the death penalty. On June 26, 2023, the Latta County Prosecutor's Office declared its intent to pursue the death penalty due to the statutory aggravating circumstances associated with the first-degree murder charges against Koberger. He remains detained at the Latta County Jail without bond, maintaining a plea of not guilty to all charges. The judge scheduled Koberger's trial for October 2, 2023, accommodating requests from both Koberger's attorney and the state. As of now, no further updates have been disclosed to the public regarding the case. However, it's speculated that prosecutors have requested to schedule Koberger's trial for the summer of 2024. As for the question regarding Koberger's motive for committing this heinous act, the answer remains elusive. Law enforcement authorities believe that the intended target of his attack was either Madison or Cayley. Nevertheless, no substantial clues or evidence have been discovered thus far to confirm this statement keeping the case still a mystery, waiting to be unraveled. So, do you hold the belief that Koberger was responsible for the deaths of the four students? If so, what could have been his motive? What form of justice do you think would be appropriate in this case? Let us know your opinions. We'd love to hear from you. Also, 
If you have any cases in mind that you want us to cover, feel free to share it in the comment sections. Subscribe to our channel, Mysterious Hook, to uncover more of the cold-blooded cases from around the world. Until next time, stay safe.